the meeting of the uh, Bolton Advisory Committee. Uh, okay, a couple of items, a uh, few items on the agenda tonight. So I think uh, first up, before we do anything else, we should probably go through our uh, reorganization since we're operating under sort of uh, interim positions. Um, so we need to uh, select a permanent uh, chair, vice chair and secretary. Um, our committee members who aren't present, maybe we should assign them some of the less desirable. Topics. <laughs> but anyway, um, so so let's uh, let, let's start with with chairman. If there are any nominations for chairman, I nominate you. I'll second that. Okay. Any other nominations? All right, let's uh, vote on that. Um, roll call, Bill. Aye. Craig. Aye. Don. Aye. Uh, and I'll I'll vote yes as well. Okay. How about uh, Vice Chair? I nominate Craig. I'll second that. Any other nominations? Okay. Uh, Bill? Aye. Craig? Aye. Don? Aye. And I'm a yes as well. Okay, and then uh, finally, Secretary. So the last few years, we've actually had two. Um, Bill, wh what do you think? Do you want to continue that? Should we have two secretaries, or, or do you want to drop down to one? Or? Uh, I can continue it as, as one, I think got a pretty good system in place. All right. Uh, Any nominations for secretary? The last few years we've actually I nominate Bill. Uh, I'll second that. Bill, what do you think? Other, other nominations? Do we have two secretaries? Or do you want to drop down to one? Okay. Uh, roll call, Bill. Aye. Greg? Aye. Don? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Okay. So I think we're we're set for the year in terms of our uh, advisory committee positions. All right. So next up on the agenda, um, so uh, Chris just joined us. So there's an issue going on apparently with uh, beavers on Main Street, which I am very curious to, to oh. hear. Well, it, it is it is curious and fascinating because uh, I. I yeah, you know, unfortunately, it's going to be a problem. I think that's going to grow. They've they're they're a lot of them, but um, yeah. So so the so let me give some you know some back history. So we it's it's an area that we've had problems in before, but prior to this problem, uh, it was it was really managed by uh, the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, um, and then for some reason, in their infinite wisdom, they decided that. Your local board of health were the better choice, which we're not because we're not, we don't know much about these things. But in any case, our role in this is that if there's beaver activity and it is, uh, there's, there's a clear and present danger to a septic system, a well, uh, things like that, then we're allowed to issue what's called a 10 day emergency permit. And what that does is that a trapper will go out and trap the beaver and you can stop there, um, but typically, if there were beaver there before, they're going to come back. So, what's happened here is is we've got about a half a dozen houses on Main Street that are being impacted by this. Um, so, we are working with a company called Beaver Solutions out of Southampton, who are kind of giving us the advice and counsel. And what it came right down to is that uh, in their professional opinion, the beaver that are there need to be taken out of there because I guess they remember or have a memory of water levels. So even if we were to put it in a leveling device, they would work as hard as they could to basically put the water back where it was. So we're taking the existing beaver out. Um, I'm here to see you guys because again, I think this is going to become a more common problem for us. And that moving forward, we're probably going to put some money in our budget for this, kind of like rabies, kind of like mosquito, you know, the central uh, mosquito control program. Um, they're not done. 
Uh, so in any case, so let me step back. So once the trapping's done and the the beaver that were there are gone, then phase two is a, a lowering device, which I'm sure you have seen somewhere that basically it's the cage and the pipe and, and you're basically trying to trick them. It'll allow us to bring the water level down. And then according to Mike Callahan at Beaver Solutions, you know, once that's done, a beaver is going to come back, but they're not going to know what it was. They're going to find it as it is and, and likely be very happy and, and just kind of continue on and live in that habitat, which I think is great because I've got really no no bones to break with beavers until they start causing damage. Um, so the way I'm looking at this and the way I want to approach this in the future, like I said, like rabies, like mosquitoes, is that we'll put money in our budget for the trapping piece. And then <clears throat> once a, a, an actual structure goes in, I talked to Don about this and it will go to, um, will likely fall under the DPW budget because it's going to be a, you know, kind of like a culvert, you know, a structure that's, you know, we're going to hire these guys to come in, make sure is, is, is working once a year or so, and then, you know, give us advice and counsel as, as we move along so we can kind of coexist, if you will. Um, here to kind of introduce myself, you guys, the, the, the kind of the background it's in process, so we don't have any finished numbers to give you, but just to give you a, a, an idea of what we're talking about, um, you know, all in, we're looking at about $3,800. Um, that's between the trapping and then the device, you know, the lowering device. Again, we're in process. So when we actually get the numbers, then I'm going to be coming to you guys because we haven't carried anything in our budget historically. And then it'll also give me time to to talk to DPW and make sure that they're kind of on the same page with this as well. So there it is. Anybody have any questions? I've got a couple, Chris. Um, what area of Main Street is this? Is this the downtown or? So or basically, the- it starts it starts right across from Town Hall, where that where that those two houses are, um, yep. right across the street that have a right. shared system brand new system, you know, uh, and then it goes all the way down to um, the Sawyer House, the, the Historical Society. So so all those properties in back, you know, many of which have new modern systems, but technically just raising those water six inches takes them out of compliance because of, of the way the systems are designed and built. Uh, but there are some old systems out there. There potentially are some, some hand dug wells as well. Uh, and so that's what we're looking at. Yeah, I, I, that was one of my understandings is there's a lot of rules around putting a well or especially a septic near water. And I'm surprised that six inches would modify that. I, could you give me a little context on what the rules are there? I thought it was like 200 feet from water. And- well, so so again, our concern is not so much the distance from water, uh, and also Don understand that that if there's a if there's a pre existing house there, and yeah. they need a brand new septic system, they're you know barring you know barring the, the fact that there's no physical way to do it, they'll likely get a system, and they'll likely get a lot of variances and a lot of relief for offsets and things like that. Okay. Our board's concern is not necessarily how the water is approaching the system. It's the water in the ground as it rises. You know, so if you're looking at a pond coming up your yard, you know, that theoretically that water level is tracking under the ground so that if your system's a new system, it's built and designed to to give us four feet of uh, clearance between the bottom of the system and the, and the natural earth to give it the depth to treat properly, then you've, you've kind of taken some of that uh, elevation out of the mix. Okay. Yeah, no, I I, I can, it sounds like a, a, a important problem to deal with right away. I just wanted to make sure that I understood. It sounds like a lot of these places are pre-existing non-conforming. Yep. Okay. Yep. Which is again, which is not uncommon. You know, again, a lot of small town main streets, you know, the houses are on, I'm on main in street. some cases a half an <laughs> yeah, acre. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, so, Chris, obviously for, you know, FY25, we can build something into the budget. That's pretty straightforward. So, uh, but you think for this year, uh, you may need you, roughly 3,800, you said? I don't, we're not going to need the 3,800. That's the, that's the total amount. And, and what I, I'm, I'm remiss at and we'll take care of uh, in the next day or so is, is I'll send you guys or I'll send it to Jenny so that she can distribute to you guys 
the um, the proposal, the you know, the commentary from the from the Beaver experts saying this is what we should do, and this is how we should to give you guys the background to understand better. But um, right. so basically, I again, I haven't had a talk, had, excuse me, haven't had a chance to talk to Randy, but um, you know, our budget's pretty small. We basically like to think we know at the start of the year what we're going to need and and put it in there. Um, I'm hoping that Randy's budget's got a little bit more bandwidth, so maybe he can absorb uh, his piece. But uh, to, you know, to get right to your question, uh, so the trapping itself, which I think again, we're our board is willing to kind of take on as a, a responsibility. Uh, in this case, is sixteen hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. um, then the pond leveler after that is nineteen hundred dollars, and there's a, P, you know, a permit fee of two fifty in here. And then a couple of other options, which may go into play because, um, you know, while this has been going on, they've actually been trying to dam up uh, a, an old historic stone culvert behind uh, the Sawyer house. And so they've agreed to take a look at that. We don't know exactly what they're going to propose. We're hoping that this leveling draws the water down enough that it's no longer an issue or an interest to them. Uh, and then we're done. So, so just to yeah. kind of give you the range. Okay. Well, this certainly falls in the unforeseen expense category. So yeah. if, if we need to use a transfer request, whatever. Okay. Well, I've never had to do that. So it'll be interesting going through the process. Bear with me and be patient when I get there. But uh, again, just kind of wanted to give you the heads up before mm -hmm. walking in saying, I need this, you know, this yeah. money. So now I, I'm, I'm new to the board this year. I'm just curious. Would this be, I know the, the selectmen have a, a couple hundred thousand dollars to do with as they deem fit. Is this more appropriate for something like that? Uh, you know, again, greater minds like your own will be, would be the one to tell us that. I mean, so uh, okay. I, I, you know, yeah. from my perspective, I, I know that we don't have the budget for it. And okay. so, so to your point, Don, maybe the... Um, it's not a point. It's a question. I well, just, so to your, I point, I guess to your question, I mean, inquiry. maybe the maintenance of the of the um, of the leveling devices is a select board piece. I just I just thought mm -hmm. of DPW because again they're managing culverts and and I think actually we already have Beaver Solutions in town for I think Bower Springs. They may work with Conscom and that, and I huh? think there's another spot as well. So, okay. um, I I don't know, and I guess yeah. so for me it's kind of a learning process as well. But just wanted to make sure since we've kind of engaged these guys that that you guys knew that some money was going to have to come from yeah. somewhere. I, I, I think it's certainly worth a discussion with DPW, and it's a small amount sure. of money, so they may be able to cover it in their budget. But we do have we do maintain the reserve fund and with the advisory committee, so okay. we also have a mechanism if we need to to take care of this. So okay. we'll, we'll, we'll get it sorted. Yep. Great. Any other questions while Chris is here? Awesome. Well, thanks, Chris. We appreciate the heads up, and that was that was a great rundown. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Nice to see you guys. Have a great night. All thanks. right. Thanks. You too. See you. Okay. Next item, and this is the the big ticket item on the agenda tonight, is uh, reviewing uh, the warrant for the special town meeting, and we have uh, several representatives here from both uh, the school committee and the school district. So, this is great. Uh, let me just share my screen uh, with the draft warrant and we can uh, walk through that. Let me see. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes. And is it, is it big enough? Okay. Um, three articles on the warrant and so uh, we will just uh, talk through and vote on these, although actually we only have to vote on two of these. Okay, so uh, the first one is just uh, three small unpaid bills uh, from FY23, uh, one for 195, one for about 1400 and one for 704. Any, anyone have uh, any questions on those hmm. comments? I'm taken aback by the invoice magic myself. But... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. All right. Is there a, a motion to uh, 
vote on a recommendation here. I move we approve Article 1. I'll I second, second that. that. Right. Roll call. Bill? Aye. Greg? Aye. Don? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Okay. So the next one now is uh, the, the real reason for the special town meeting is approving uh, the the new school building project. Um, Don Lowe sent out uh, a little presentation last week. Um, has everyone had a chance to look at that? Would it, do, you, do you want me to, I can share that if there's a, a need to do that. Um, it would be good to share it. Okay, all right, let me uh, I'll quickly jump to that. Um, if I can find it, hold on. Okay. Everyone see that? Yes. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so here we go. And and actually, um, if anyone from the school district wants to to uh, jump in and and run through this, by all means. Yeah. If I could just jump in real fast. Okay. Um, Boss Mall Curran, Director of Finance and Operations. I uh, know some of you from my day to day work, um, but thank you for the opportunity to be here. I know that Amy Cohen, uh, both in school committee rep, is here as well. Um, we're also joined by Marianne Williams, who is our owner's project manager with Skanska USA and has been in through the project uh, really for almost two full years now. Correct, Marianne, if not a little bit longer. Um, I came on board at central office last year, so I'm almost a year into the, the knowledge base of the project. And obviously, Ms. Cohen's been um, highly involved as a school committee member all along. Uh, I would just add, I see Superintendent Downing here, he's actually participating in the Lancaster uh, FinCom meeting right now, but if he got out early, he wanted to make sure he could jump right in. We did come up with some updated slides, um, given that those aren't necessarily sent by, by Mr. Lowe ahead of time, because we just wrapped up some stuff today on them. I'm happy to share those, or we could use these and I could update you as we go, but I certainly, we've, we've put some more detail and more updated information and if that's the will of the, the the group today yeah i think if you have updated information let's use that yeah okay great um can you see that okay i'm sharing on my side screen i want to make sure that you can all see that can you see it yes yep great um so this is a modification of the presentation that was brought forward to school committee on August 2nd, at which point they voted to incur the debt um, for the high school, which triggers obviously the 60 day process or the seven day process to notify the towns. And then, then from 60 days from there, and this is why you're discussing that special town meeting warrant article tonight. Um, Ms. Cole, did you wanna add anything from a school committee perspective before I get started, given that I just mentioned the school committee? Um, the only thing I was thinking of adding when you mentioned that we took a vote was that we did vote unanimously to incur this debt. Um, and so did the school building committee. And I'm, I'm on both and I've been involved uh, with the school building committee since the beginning. So I thought that was an important thing to add. Thank you. Um, Mary Williams, do you want to say anything before we begin? I know that if, if we can lean on you, if things come up as well. No, I think you're doing a good job, Ross, and I'll, I'll jump in if there's anything Great. I think Great. I can Thank add. You. Appreciate that. Um, okay. Um, so I just went full screen. Everybody's still good. You can see that. Um, so the purpose of this is really now to provide residents of three towns uh, with an estimate. I want to be clear about this is estimate of borrowing costs based on the available data and figures we've received from our financial advisors. We use Hilltop Securities. Um, I don't know if the town of Bolton does for financial advisement for borrowing or bonding. Um, I believe Lancaster does, but they're a well-known uh, name out there. Um, 
So some of you are aware at the very beginning of this project and really the work that ramped up this past year was around what to do and what decisions to make with regards to the high school. Several options were presented. Some immediately have to get, had to come off the, the options board. Um, option one was a base repair. Um, so I'll show a little bit more detail on that. Option 3A, uh, which was an addition and renovation option for the current building, and then uh, several options for new construction uh, on the site. Uh, you may be aware that other sites were looked at, however, due to cost constraints, and there's no reimbursement for purchase of real estate in order to build a new high school through the MSBA, which is the Massachusetts School Building Authority, provides grant foundation money for, for building projects. Hmm. So option one, base repair, um, which would basically just repair our existing facility issues, accessibility, code-related issues, um, would do a lot because it would not only replace all of our HVAC systems, windows, roof, code modifications, energy modifications where available, all the ADA accessibility modifications, structural modifications. We have some, some spaces that don't meet um, size requirements where walls would have to be moved and uh, replacement of all the interior damage finishes. Um, there is a building tour coming up on uh, September 9th, um, if anybody's so interested. Uh, Amy, I don't know if you can send a link through the chat about signing up, but if you're interested in touring the building, we'll be doing building tours where you can really get a look at the interior and the degre and the really the, the long-term impact um, of, of where things are at in the building. The issue with doing it this way is it wouldn't meet the future educational program needs of, of our high school students. Um, you know, the building was built in 1961. Certainly there's a lot of changes that have happened in education, but we're, we're not planning for kids who are going into the workforce tomorrow. It's years from now. And um, that includes our youngest students and students that are not even in the district yet. Um, the issue uh, further with that is that we would have to do this construction around the school schedule and potentially have to use uh, modular systems for a long term in order to do that work. Uh, we're talking five to six years worth um, and all of the undersized spaces for, for classrooms would sort of remain the same um, where we can't move walls and none of this is MSBA reimbursable. The estimated cost on that, if you look on that far left option was about um, 110 to 120 million, including escalation over the time frame that it would take to construct that. Um, so therefore the district share on this would be 110 to 120 million. The addition renovation. Can I, can I make a, a quick comment? You, you mentioned the, um, the tour. I, I went on one of those tours back in April and I would, would really recommend it to anyone who hasn't seen it. I thought it was very insightful in terms of, uh, some of the, the issues that I just didn't appreciate before I went on the tour. So I thought it was a worthwhile two hours or so. Thank you. I appreciate that that endorsement. Our facilities directors worked really hard to make sure that those show all of the, the nastiness and ugliness of the building. Marianne? Yes, and one more thing I wanted to add. I think it's noteworthy that to, it's one thing to have construction happening on the campus. It's another thing to have construction happening while you're trying to run the operations of the school and the program, and that it's very intrusive uh, and disruptive to uh, students learning. So I just wanted to add that as a little caveat, even though it's not quantified in terms of dollars, it certainly, um, yep. you know, impacts students. Yep. And that's a good segue into uh, the, the addition renovation option, because that, that same issue would happen. Now, certainly the strengths of that were we would get close to meeting the educational program needs of our high school students now and in the future. Um, we would, uh, have the ability to do a lot of site work. Obviously, you'd have to move the entire athletic complex over because the building would have to stretch back. I think everyone's aware, you can see that red line in the sort of top left or to right of the um, of the site map. Uh, that's the Tennessee gas pipeline. I know you're all Bolton residents, so you're probably aware of this, but other, other towns may not be. Uh, but that's a 14 inch natural gas pipeline, which we cannot use obviously. However, it runs through the property and it, it causes site constraints along with some wetland areas and obviously setbacks for neighboring properties. Um, so there's that piece, um, you know, um, would be able to do some interior work to build some learning communities. Um, there's the weaknesses, again, of the disruption to learning 
you'd have to move the existing athletic complex. Um, again, it's a six year timeline, potentially even longer, and we'd have cost escalations throughout um, and certainly a less efficient design than building new. And going back to that, if you look at 3A, the potential cost on that, including the escalation, would be uh, 254 million and above. And again, could take up to eight years. And the estimated share on that um, would be an estimate of about 200 million to the to the district, and therefore to the taxpayers. So moving into the the options for new construction, uh, Mr. Cole, go ahead. Who put these uh, estimates together? So this was done by uh, Castle Booz Associates, which is our architects. And I believe, Marianne, your group, obviously, as our OPM, had some input and uh, advisement on this, correct? You want to talk about that process a little bit? Yes, we, we ended up having um, an independent uh, third-party estimator involved with the process that evaluated all of the uh, options in terms of cost and schedule and escalation. And one of the things that um, became apparent, um, especially since the uh, pandemic, is that the longer you go out in time, and this option 3A is a total of eight years, the more risk you are um, to the potential of uh, having something happen in terms of uh, unpredicted uh, escalation in the market, just like nobody predicted the pandemics, but if something, you know, if something happened, the longer you go out in time, the more likely that something could happen that we couldn't predict. Sure. So through the schematic design review and process option 4D, and we solicited input from the communities on this, um, 4D was, was uh, chosen. Obviously, you can see where it's located. The baseball field um, in the parking lot a little bit to the left take up the majority of where the existing building is, with new construction happening close to the building, but not disrupting the old building at, at, based on uh, this model. Um, on the right, you can sort of see a breakdown of how the spaces in, in large concept are broken down. Obviously, the strength here, number one, is that it aligns with the educational program of our students now and in the future. Um, we reoriented some stuff. So there's a, a sort of a uh, direct access to the gymnasium and the athletic fields in tandem. Um, there also becomes a, a main entrance uh, to some open community space, which then can tie into the gymnasium and the auditorium, making it really a, a, a public community based um, strength and asset for all three of our towns. Um, we would maintain the current athletic stadium at this point, which I think we know is a, a huge uh, bonus. My kids are, are currently in high school and anytime through youth sports or high school sports that we've landed there as visitors, every parent I know makes some level of comment um, about the, the the field, the track and the complex and just how it's such a nice facility. So it's good to see that that stays intact. Um, it wouldn't displace the current on-site well. Um, our construction timeline is certainly uh, much less based or compared to the others. Um, and this also gives us a good chance to redesign entrance and exits. Um, you can't quite see it on here, um, but we were, we had looked, I, and Marion, forgive me, I think after this point, there was an ad of some access from Green Road for emergency vehicles in the event that 117 is blocked, correct? Uh, yes, actually, you'll see where Main Street uh, line intersects with Green Road. There will be a rotary that's going to be installed there um, for traffic calming purposes. Um, that hasn't happened yet, but that's a right. that's a project outside of this project. Right, right. Um, so the 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 weakness is obviously to this sort of uh, design possibility we're looked at. However, again, this is still the most beneficial. Um, based on the work that's done, is that we have to move the baseball field. Um, this does put the building on the current baseball field. However, again, this uh, gives us an opportunity to build a newer baseball field. Um, and looking at things like turf gives you a longer season, gives access to it through other sports and clubs and, and certainly youth sports. Um, we are able to, to, to build the building while school is happening. Now, it doesn't mean that things don't get disrupted, but it's a lot less disruptive to our students now and in the future 
uh, that will be in that building during construction, uh, given that it does not displace the current building square foot or, 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 or footprint during construction. Um, we do have to move some septic um, issues um, and due to some site work, um, just because it goes back that you think that that field is relatively flat, but when you really look at it, it does need some site work here. Um, so that was that's an added sort of um, concern about moving it. But ultimately, this was chosen through the school building committee um, and through the process to, to pick this as a schematic design moving forward. Um, this is the one that's been presented through MSBA um, and through the, um, the scope and budget meetings with them as well. Um, Amy, go ahead. and see your. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that this this was the concept design, but it has evolved mm -hmm. since then. Um, yeah, to some extent, it, it certainly has. Yep, as we've narrowed down on schematic design, Marion, I don't know if you want to add in anything that I didn't say regarding that. I think uh, Amy brings up a good point. Yes, I think in, in concept, what we were trying to identify um, options relative to the other options that were available, we were trying to look at what was most efficient in terms of square footage and cost, and also looking at operations costs for the building. And so there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, caveats in, in all of these options when trying to evaluate them. And what what we really try to do is, you know, understand knowing how the MSBA thinks and what their space requirements were, we were really trying to maximize the reimbursement that could be uh, received for this project. So sometimes if there are examples where one option might be more expensive than another option, but you might have greater participation from the MSBA. So what you need to look at really is what your participation participation is um, and and that can uh, help you make an informed decision about which we did about the uh, options and I just want to say that we we had also had some public input where there were there was an opportunity for folks in the community to respond to the options and um, I'd have to go back and look but I think there was something like maybe a total of 80 or 90 responses but um, the feedback that we got from the community was for this option for new construction. Thank you, Marianne. Um, so moving forward into, I think, more of the agenda at hand is with regards to the cost of the project. So the estimated total project cost stands at $241.7 million. Um, Marianne, you could add in here if you want, but I want to make sure I speak to a couple of things. Is this also includes um, escalation of cost over the life of the project? Uh, to, I think it's called the midpoint, Marion, in, in the construction world. Um, this includes um, some other contingencies. This includes site work. This includes designer fees and all those and types of things. We are currently in our search process for our construction management um, firm. Um, and that process is ongoing. And the reason we started that now is there is the need to look at geothermal um, to, to heat and cool the building. And in order to do that, based on where those timelines are with those companies, uh, we need to be a little bit ahead. Um, so if this vote moves forward and the building is approved uh, by the towns, we're ready to go um, and we're not gonna slow down at all. Um, so all of those things are built into this. And this is the, the project cost really voted to not exceed by the school committee. Um, so people ask questions about, well, it could be more than this. Um, so no, this is the, this is the, this is the sort of cap, Mary, and I forget the, is it max guaranteed? Give me the right language here, uh, in your yes. world. So, um, the estimated total project cost is everything soup to nuts. That, that's, you know, design costs, the OPM, technology, uh, furniture, fixture, equipment, it's everything. Construction costs, the construction manager, um, all the people who are, are involved with the project. It's everything. Yeah. And then the MSBA reimbursement of the 64.7 million, almost 64.8 million, is based on their participation of um, reimbursement on eligible costs. Yeah. And I would and, say- and I, have, I have a slide that's a little bit more detailed on that coming okay. up so we, we can get, because I know that's a question that's been coming up in our communities. So based on the reimbursement that we've um, 
um, sort of been given as our maximum reimbursement from MSBA, our total taxpayer contribution would be at 176.9 million. So just using the regional agreement language with regards to the capital costs for the high school and the FY24 enrollment data, which the regional agreement cites uh, enrollment data as a way as how it's broken down um, when you're assessing capital. This is just an estimate per town. I'll show on a couple of future slides about how this breaks down a little bit um, into household um, estimates, um, but this just gives you a breakdown. So here's the reimbursement information that, that Marion was talking about. And in general, I know that people heard initially, uh, you know, that 49% reimbursement rate, uh, our effective rate on what actually um, is um, eligible. Um, and Marianne's going to give me some more detail on this in a second. But that puts the, the project reimbursement rate um, at 26.8%. So a couple of things on this. Um, the the 49.53%, when you add in some incentives for uh, green energy, um, we get to 55%. That's 55% of eligible costs. There's constraints on that. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see this. This was presented at our school building committee last week. Um, the site work cost limit, we only can go up to a certain percentage of our overall project uh, for site work reimbursement. Um, also, there's a limit from the MSBA on the square footage uh, reimbursement at $393 per square foot. When Attleboro um, did their project, which they just wrapped up, when they started, it was $330 per square foot, roughly, um, from an MSBA. So that's gone up. However, we all know that escalating cost of construction materials has increased. So currently today, um, it's at about $800 per square foot to do it. But there's obviously escalation built in over the cost of the project, which drives us up closer around $1,000 per square foot um, in, in future dollars. A couple other things that are built into this that are not reimbursable. So the MSBA gives you $2,400 per student uh, for fixtures, furniture, equipment, and technology. The budget that 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 $241 million includes a $4,000, um, correct, Marianne, a $4,000 per student, because we know that that's not enough. So it's already already put into the, the, the overall number. And then there's some other things that are not eligible that are listed here. But that's basically the extent of sort of a summary about why is it not that 49%? Why is it where, you know, you're hearing now it's 27%. And that's really the, the piece of it is certain costs are eligible, others are not. Certainly a swimming pool is not eligible. Uh, that makes sense to me. Obviously a little bit more difficult when you get into the MSBA saying that the, the, the reimbursement for square footage is limited. However, escalation of, of construction costs has gone up. Marion, please add in anything that I have not in my, my limited knowledge here. No, I think you did a very good job of explaining it. And, and just to boil it down to a simple example is that when you mentioned Atterborough High School, Atterborough High School was the cost for construction, not the total project cost, was $468 per square foot. And the reimbursement was $333. Now, if you look at the building cost limit per square foot, it's gone up $60 per square foot, but the cost of construction has gone up $300 per square foot. So you can see that they, you know, they increased it by a certain amount, but the costs have actually gone up by a greater amount. And so it's creating this, this larger gap. And that's why you have a differential between um, your reimbursement rate and then your effective reimbursement rate. I think also now is a good time to talk about the MSBA from a little bit of another standpoint is, you know, if if we do not um, or, or did not move forward with this project, we sort of have to now get in the back of the line with the MSBA. And there's a lot of other school districts that are, are in the queue and a lot more that are going to come. Um, and so saying, saying, no doesn't mean that we now need get to renegotiate with MSBA. Marion and her group and Superintendent Downing have done a great job with advocating with the MSBA to try to get um, our base reimbursement rate up as much as possible because that brings up your effective rate 
Um, but this is where we're at today. So not doing it doesn't mean that we get to go back to the drawing board with the MSBA. Um, it, it puts us potentially at the back of the line. Amy, did you want to add into that? Yeah, the only other thing I wanted to point out is that the feasibility study costs that were already approved by the towns, yep. those will be reimbursed by the MSBA if this project is approved by the voters in our towns. But if if it's not, um, it won't be reimbursed. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding of, uh, of how that works. So there's an incentive built in. Um, well, to, to your point, Amy, there is a risk that they would claw back money from the district. Um, but what also would happen is if if you, um, and when I say you, I mean if the three communities did not proceed with the project, if there was interest in doing anything more with the project um, in terms of a different option, you would have to fill out another statement of interest. You would have to fund a feasibility study all over again. And you would have to go through that process. And MSBA selects people into the program based on need and readiness. And if uh, if you have a failed vote, then um, you're demonstrating that the readiness is not there in the community to proceed with the project. So um, I know that there have been other communities in the past where um, it might take them seven or eight years to get back into the pipeline. And um, if I look at what construction costs were seven or eight years ago and look at it today, you can certainly anticipate that it, it more than likely almost double. So it's um, it's not a winning proposition. Um, and I think, the, I think a, a good way to look at this is that Mass School Building Authority doesn't exist for the, for the purpose of um, building schools and committee and communities they exist to help support and it's a grant program and they contribute based on uh, economic need and so the good news is is if you're, you're in a uh, you know if you're in a community that um, is doing very well overall financially in terms of their um, poverty uh, wealth income factor that's good news for your community um, and that's why you see other communities um, that might be gateway communities that ha have a higher reimbursement, um, but they're also uh, poorer communities. Don? I have a bunch of numbers I'd like to get from you if I can. Um, you had this nice analysis here with site work and building cost limit, et cetera. What is ours in each of these areas? Um, Marion, we had that at the last school building committee, correct? It's, it's right there in the Shober's base points. Every community starts off with 31%. And then and the average is 78. What's ours in this project? Oh, no, the average is not 78. The, they start with a base point of 31 for all communities. And uh, no, Marion, he's, he's talking about site cost. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize you were talking. No worries. Um, so if you look at the, every site is different. So for example, um, this program uh, with the Neshoba School is really um, actually going to receive 4% four, uh, 4 reimbursement under the, the new 2023 Green Schools Policy with the MSBA. Um, so all of that, you know, contributes to reimbursement. The site is individual. So if you look at, for example, we have geothermal and you look at some of those issues, you know, the more you invest really in this, this green technology, the greater your reimbursement is because otherwise that would have been 2%. And, right, um, but do you know what the, our site cost per square foot is? Yes. Maybe another way of phrasing the question is, what was the value that was used in the estimate for our site I, cost? I would have to pull up the I, I just dropped the budget into the chat, uh, the line-by-line -line budget that was submitted to the MSBA. Um, 
it brings you to the website for the building project that has all these details. And I'm trying to zoom it up enough to give you that answer, but. Um, yeah, I, I'm looking at e each one of these. I'd like to know what our uh, cost is, is estimated to be. Um, I was also curious, um, what's the square footage before and after? The square footage of the building. Of the building, the building now is and the building after you're done? Uh, the square footage of the building now, I believe, is around 199,000 square feet. The square yep. footage of yep. the new building is two uh, is 209,529 square feet. Round I'm going off the top point. of my so head here. One, uh, 200 yep. versus 10, roughly. Uh, right. So okay. there's... If you look at the reimbursement from the MSBA, um, it was four percent, three to four percent of the square footage was considered ineligible. I think that's pretty good. Um, if you look at that, because really you're maintaining some signature programs. Um, you're you had undersized classrooms in the existing school, and in order to receive the grant, you have to have a minimum size classroom and um, a lot of the classrooms were in the 700 some odd square feet. The MSBA requires it to be um, in, in the 800 and I want to say 50 foot square range. So when you start looking at that, um, to participate in the grant, to receive the grant, you have to follow their guidelines. And how many students now and how many students after? Uh, What's the capacity? The, the design enrollment, which is what they call it, is 925 students. And that's meant to be a design for school at 85% utilization. There's room to go up to 100% utilization, which means it could accommodate up to 1,088 students. So 925 so students 925. at the 85%. And utilization. Uh, I would have to defer to the district. I think it might be 850 or 800. Yeah, I think it's around somewhere. 890. No, it's, correct it's, me if I'm wrong. No, I'm going to pull it up in just a second off screen yeah. here. It's, it's a little bit low and that's closer to 830, but hold on. Let me grab that. So, Don, ask your next question. And I'll grab that. Okay. And then when you guys get a chance, I'd like to go back to that. The site work and building costs, that sort of stuff. Yes. Just get those numbers. Yes, because I don't I want have to it, um, shoot off the Did you see there. it in the chat there, Don? I'm sorry? Did you see that I put it in the chat? No, I don't. I see Google on the screen. Yeah, if you oh, click that me. link, it will bring you directly to the line-by-line -line item. And I'm trying to... Oh, in the chat. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I thought you said chart. I no. should have known someone from New England wouldn't use the R in there. My mistake. Um, uh, Ross, the link is in the chat if you want to click directly on it. To the enrollment? Um, Oh, no, enrollment. not for the enrollment. Yeah. Sorry. Just hang on one second. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get my, I can't zoom in properly to see the line items and the numbers, but I'm trying to. I'm gonna, the reason I'm, I'm doing it this way is I want to grab this link and put it in there. So this is the um, last spring when the district looked at um, adding school choice slots. We looked at enrollment. Um, okay. And if you look on the very last page here, you can look at the FY24 projected enrollment. Um, okay. So the high school is effectively at 800. 839? 839 is what I got. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now that, that's probably gone up or down a little bit since then, but it's a pretty good en enrollment projection. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, on, current, on the current building. So if you think about it that way, if we're at eight, call it 840 even, um, that's, you know, a good distance from 1,080 and uh, which would be the capacity of the, uh, the new building at full capacity, not the 85%, obviously. Right. Okay. So I was able to 
Mary, and I feel like you might be better to answer this. I have this up on my screen. If I shared it, I don't know if that would be helpful, but I have the building site work line item. Is that what you're asking about, Don? Yes. What the average is compared to these numbers, average per square foot. Okay. Um, that's very, that's site specific for each project. I understand on how, that, Mary. Yep. I know. Depending, depending on how much work is being done, the size of your site. Yep. No, I understand there's a great deal of variability and all that. I'm just, I'm a numbers person. I, I'm, I'm a recovering CPA and numbers <laughs> Okay. Numbers well, are what do it for me. I'm, I'm the sorry. The number they have up there is that it, the average is $78 a square foot for typical site costs. Okay. So what I, I think the question from, from Don is what, what is the budget um, in the submitted budget to the MSBA for site work? And do yeah. we know what that breaks down to per square foot of site work? Is that your question, Don? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. I'm doing some basic math, but I don't want to. Okay. I so, think this might oh, be something that we could follow up with. Yeah. I see. I'm, I'm looking at um, that's fine. looking at a want, different document. If you want a few, some more time to get come back to this, that's perfectly no, fine. No, I, I can tell you it's $20,131,180. Okay, that's the number I was looking at too. I wanted to make sure. Okay, and then there is an eligible site cost of seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars for the maintenance building, and then the potentially um, eligible direct site cost is uh, nineteen million, and um, you know, given that they cap it at thirty nine dollars a square foot. And, and what they do is they look at the uh, eligible building square footage, which is 199,388 square feet. Uh, I am coming up with $96 per square foot, but I don't know what that includes. And it looks like it includes markup and allowance. So I don't know how we're, I want to make sure if we're throwing numbers out there that we're comparing apples to apples. Well, I, well, what it what it comes down to is we we could look at an estimate and then there are mockups, there are contingencies, there's there's things that are added. Um, to so my quick math was also ninety six. Okay. About ninety six dollars a square foot. Yeah, that's what I got. Okay. okay. So, so the site ha also has. Um, some of the considerations it has geothermal. So there's a cost for geothermal, but then there That's is also um, yep. additional reimbursement for the geothermal as well. And the, the savings on the operating costs over time. So if we're talking 241 million total, throw the whole thing together. And just using roughly that we've got about 200,000 square feet. We're at about, is that, have I got my periods right? About 210,000 square feet in total, okay. approximately. Yeah. Well, let's say it's 240, 240 million to 240,000. So it's about a thousand bucks a square foot. Total project cost. At a very high level. Okay. At a what? At a very high level, yes. Yep. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, Ross, do you have, are there more slides in your presentation yeah yep. want to make sure looks that looks like we have another another question on whoever is iphone here yeah um it's me omid uh, i was gonna say can uh, we keep all the questions or uh, things like that or the ones that need research um to the end or we can submit it to committee and then they can provide those answers in a response so we can move on with the uh presentation and make sure everyone and everything is heard yeah, I know. I got. I'm fine. We can, on. Okay. We can certainly um, follow up later. I think the constraint we're under is um, is we're 
hoping to vote tonight on the articles. Uh, if we need to defer that, we can. We'll, let's, let's see how it goes when we get to the end of the presentation. Okay. Um, so in building estimates, and again, I want to be strong about the word estimates here, um, we use some key understandings. Uh, the school committee voted to the, incur the debt uh, a few weeks ago and using that $241 million number um, as the, uh, the co project cost. Um, our estimates are based on um, fiscal assumptions of current market conditions uh, that are subject to change. Um, we certainly all know this. Um, yep. So finalized cost to the taxpayers really wouldn't be fully known until everything is said and done, project is wrapped up and everything is bonded. Um, the annual capital debt assessments, I think as I shared at the beginning are subject to the regional agreement language and therefore to the enrollment at the high school. Um, and we were given, we gave our budget and draft cash flows um, to our, our financial advisors and they've provided back to our bond advisory group, uh, three borrowing options. Um, our, our bond advisory group is made up of um, members of FinCom's town offices um, and uh, certainly the town administrators were invited as well. And we've met with our financial advisors and based on what they've shown us, we got feedback from those, those folks that are out in the community and know the town finances as far as what they think um, for borrowing options. We're not at a decision point yet. Uh, we wouldn't do anything um, until we had positive um, results from town meeting the debt exclusion votes. However, we do need to start getting going on this. We can provide some estimates. So really three options, right? Option one, option A is bond the entire project at the front. And, it, and, and we know that these won't necessarily shake out this way, but this is where we started. Option B would be to do it in two tranches. So really to do it in two different portion um, and a year to two years apart. Um, not only to split up the bonding, but to make sure we have the right and money available for cash flow. Option C would be a little bit more uh, of a challenge in the sense that, you know, you do more notes as you go to meet your cash flow needs and then bond at the entire conclusion. Um, those might be more subject um, to variability. Um, however, you know, it's still an option that's on the table. Option A is really what we're presenting today, and that's what was presented to school committee. And the reason for that is number one, it's the most simplistic. I don't think we're gonna end up there, but it gives a sense for estimate purposes of just looking at the rates um, at a 30 year um, term. Um, so it's the total project cost minus the, the reimbursement from the MSBA, which leaves us with that, um, that number that is sub, uh, would be assessed to taxpayers. We would, in this scenario, again, for the estimated tax assessment for household purposes, look at that option A, um, we use the town property tax assessments and, and, and certainly our um, financial advisors provided us the sort of like, what would the impact be per thousand dollars of assessed value? We assumed interest rates of four to four and a half percent. Our financial advisors are saying that they're seeing thing bond sell at, at under four. Um, we know we're not selling today, so we don't know if that's necessarily the rate we would get. Um, but we'll know more as we get closer to a potential um, borrow date. We're using that 30 year term, um, which is a maximum, again, just to build models. Um, and again, we have to use the regional agreement data, which provides us with the, the, the um, portions that get assessed to each town. This is separate necessarily from the operating budget, which you don't look at enrollment just at the high school, you look at the five year rolling average of the entire district from your town that builds the assessment of the operating. So we have two different things. Um, and this is strictly about capital debt for the high school when it comes to um, this and the assessment um, that we, the, the data that we build in, built using the um, uh, current enrollment, the FY24 enrollment at the high school. So I'm just going to go across the Bolton line and I'm not going to necessarily read these numbers out loud, but just, just keeps it simple to see, let's just look at Bolton. So the town provided us with the, the median residential assessment and the financial advisors gave us the impact per 1,000. So we, we applied that impact per 1,000 as an, the estimated impact per 1,000 um, to uh, the median residential assessment for Bolton. And you can see the increase per year. Um, we also broke it down by month, week, and per day. Um, initially, when school committee looked at this, we just looked at per day. Um, but given um, some feedback that we received, we also broke it down now per week 
and per month. Um, we've had some great partnerships with um, our Council on Aging's, and we got some feedback of they'd like to see it that way as well. And I think it, it does make sense for any taxpayer um, to think about uh, what's the impact um, for me on a, a different basis than just just yearly. So this is where we are. Um, again, these are just estimates um, that combine that median household assessment for Bolton along with the the per 1,000 that's been applied that we received from our our financial advisors and they use the FY24 enrollment percentages for the high school that we gave them again, which is, is part of the regional agreement uh, when it comes to capital assessment for the high school. Um, I'll pause now for questions. Yeah, can I ask a quick question? Um, where does the, the range come in? Uh, if you have a total amount borrowed and a median assessment, what, what causes the variability here in the increase? So that's basically that four to four and a half so when they gave us models, we looked at four and four and a half. I can tell you our bond advisory group, um, again, they've, they've dug in a little bit more deep, uh, deeper with their questions. And um, we'll be on meeting three uh, coming up and we're getting into some, some different variability of what models could look like. Um, so this is, again, this is just basic, sort of be able to present some estimates on, on assessment per household. Um, never would we put anything out here right now to say this is what it will be. But it's to give an estimate based on those assumptions that I provided on the previous screen. Okay. So it's it's the the interest rate that's causing it. Correct. Correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's what provides the range. Yep. So just to be super clear here, the borrowing will be done, I assume, under the under the umbrella of the high school or Neshoba in general. And every year, every two, whatever, the Italian assessment will be affected as school population goes up or down for those 30 years, right? That's correct. That's the language in the regional agreement right now, yes. Okay. And whatever percentage point we end up with or you end up with is fixed? Um, it, yes. Um, our intent is obviously to provide a number that's not going to be variable over time to the borrowing um, uh, payment year over year. Again, there'll be sure. some variability to the towns based on their enrollment at the high school. Um, we are looking closely at how we can use models and tools. And this is steps up, Don, you know, this steps outside of my my understanding. This is why we have financial advisors and why we have the, the bond advisory group to ask these questions. They can use tools and models in different ways to smooth out the increase to the assessment. So we're not jumping directly to a full repayment. If we do two different tranches, they offset when they start. And then we can also do things like invest part of the borrowing to gain some money back. There's rules and regulations around that, obviously, but that can offset the increase um, in those things. It certainly you know, gives me the need, need for Tums, but I trust our experts um, and glad that they're in the room making these decisions with us um, and, and it will advise us throughout that, 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 and this is not Neshoba doing it on its own. This is Neshoba working with our financial advisors who are experts in this. And, and certainly, and the ones that we work with are, are, are the folks that do the municipal borrowing for towns and school districts across the state. I like, Russ, fixed, I like fixed funds. <laughs> Russ, did you already mention who was on that bond advisory committee? I, I believe there's um, somebody from the town of Bolton. Correct. Yeah. So your town treasurer, uh, Kristen Noel, is on there and she's been awesome. Um, she's got experience okay. with this. And she actually, when I met her, she was super informative to talk to me about, you know, we're going to be going back to look at our credit rating. Um, we're with Moody's right now. There's, you know, you can do different things. Um, but she just gave me a good overview of what that process is like. Um, she's been through it before. She's got a lot of great information and experience to add in. Um, Ross, I just want to confirm something that I think you said earlier that that the amounts that we're talking about here are not to exceed amounts. And if a few years down the road something happened and the costs really started going through the roof, that the plan would be to descope some of the effort versus go back yeah. with a budget yeah. increase. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to Marianne Williams in a second because she's she's our OPM and the expert in the in the field. 
I will say this is why the district went with the, the mechanism um, in the procurement world in Massachusetts as construction management at risk. Um, you know, a lot of districts, I think, are doing this now because of the cost escalation on top of other factors. Um, but I do know that it is sort of the preferred way to do things. And Marianne, can you talk a little bit about that question from, from your perspective and your experience with CM at risk relative to the not to exceed idea? Yes. Um, first of all, the, the 241 million that, that is the total project cost, um, that is what would be approved by the voters. We cannot exceed that number. There's an opportunity uh, with the project going forward that there will be three estimates at the various levels of design. And at 100% design development, 60% construction documents and 90% construction documents. And what happens there is that um, there'll be um, an independent cost estimate conducted by um, a consultant to the architect. And there will also be uh, the construction manager that will do a peer estimate and there'll be a reconciliation process. If the numbers exceed what we have in our budget, then we are gonna look at ways to bring that budget back into alignment. And we do that process, we go through it three times at the different iterations of design and continue to submit to the Mass School Building Authority to show that we're remaining within budget. So, um, so being over the budget is not an option. Um, that's, that's the process that, that we do and we've been very successful in doing this. We're ju we just happen to be in a very different environment in the last several years with um, the supply chain issues as a result of COVID and things that have gone on. But we have built in what we think are not excessive, but reasonable and responsible contingencies having to do with escalation, having to do with unforeseen conditions, et cetera. So we propose the budget that we you know, that we vetted, that we didn't do it in a vacuum, that we had input from um, several sources. And we feel pretty confident that um, we have a number that you can literally take to the bank. And, and that's, that's the process that we go through. Okay, great. Well, um, thanks for all the information, uh, the, the detailed information. That, that was great in answering all, all the questions. Are, are there other questions from the advisory committee for uh, anyone regarding the borrowing for the new high school? So I have one question. I understand the budget, um, the total budget would not change. But you're using option A for the borrowing. The borrowing cost could change, correct? Uh, if you use option B, which would be, I believe, two, uh, two years gap between issuance of bonds. Yeah, so those are all the models that we're, we're exploring and asking questions to our financial advisors. So you're absolutely right. So the assumptions that were used there were, were, were you know, four to four and a half percent, 30 year um and, and borrowing all at the front. So it, it could look different, um, but those are all the types of things that we're pursuing, um, not just the, the yearly uh, impact to our budget, which therefore translates into assessments to the towns, um, but what is the overall long-term cost of borrowing um, at, at different models. So those are all things that are being pursued and understood um, so we can make our best informed decisions uh, should we get to that point. Thank you. Uh, I would also add in just because I sort of my brain, um, we, you know, we currently with the, the 1999 um, edition renovation at the high school, um, which surely has not lasted, you know, as long as I think, I mean, we're at 24 years um, and it's certainly at its lifetime. We're going to be sunsetting that bonding, um, that borrowing at the end of FY25. That was refinanced. Um, so we're certainly asking those questions as well. Um, and certainly depending upon, you know, what, what bond you sell, you have the option to refinance after certain amounts of time too. So, you know, these things are, 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 are future decisions um, that we understand can be made.
but we're doing our best today to give you information um, to build understanding around estimates uh, for your purposes. Ross, could I add on to that? Because um, there are, it's my understanding there are three high school projects that are currently assessed to the towns right now. The, the turf stadium field, that's going to fall off the books 2028. Um, I believe 2028 would be our last payment, correct? So 2029, yeah. FY29 would be um, the first year without that, correct? And then the leaching field is the next year. Uh, so that's a set that we have six years left on that, that, that bond note. Um, so yeah, that would put us to about 2029. Yep. Right. So I just think it's important to remind everyone that, you know, that there is other debt that's going to be falling off the books out there as well. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right. So let me pull up the, um, or an article again, if I can find it. Uh, let me see. Okay, um, so there are still a couple of um, open questions, I think, on some of the uh, the details in the budget. So I guess my, my question to the, the advisory committee is, do you uh, feel like you're in a position to vote tonight, or do you want to defer the vote? Uh, keeping in mind that the select board uh, is intending to close the warrant on Thursday. We should vote tonight. We should vote tonight. Sure. Vote tonight. Okay. Um, I, um, you know, for, for what it's worth, when I, I mentioned that I went on, on the tour of the high school and my assessment at the end of that tour was that there that we are in desperate need of, of a new building you know uh, whether or not the proposed building is the optimal one or the most efficient or the most cost saving one we could come up with I, I can't say I don't know but I also came away with the sense that I'm not sure we could come up with something better so I, 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 this is a lot of money, but I, I feel like um, it, it's needed and I'm not sure there's a, we could spend many years and I'm not sure we would come up with a better option at the end of the day. Okay, so uh, is there a motion to um, approve this warrant article? I motion to approve this warrant article. I'll second that. Okay, roll call. Bill? Aye. Craig? Aye. Don? No. Omid? Yes. And I, I'm a yes as well. Okay. Great. Thank you, and uh, thanks to everyone from... Uh, the school district and, and Amy from the school committee uh, for joining us. You are welcome to stay and listen to more uh, advisory committee business if you'd like to, or otherwise feel free to drop off. Uh, we are simultaneously now scheduled in Stowe, so I'm going to hop over to that meeting. I appreciate your uh, your time and, and your your questions and 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 ask to us. It helps us build understanding about what what's going on in the communities for questions. So I, it's appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you yeah. for all your hard work. Well, Thank you, Don. Don, I'll see you soon. Yeah, that's true. And Don, I'd just like to extend an invitation if there's any other questions that I can be of help for you. Well, thank you, this, Amy. Please reach I, out to me. Yeah. And um, and thank you to the chairperson for allowing us, us to participate so much yeah. in the meeting. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. And I also just wanted to say, Don, you were asking me questions. Now I have the estimate pulled up here. Is anything else I can answer for you? But yeah, it's nice. No, if you want to send them quick. along to the group, that's fine. It's all information is always well, good. If, if you send me the, what, what I think we could do is, uh, Ross, is is send the budget, basically. Send send the budget document from the Mass School yep. Building Authority, and you, you yep. it's and all there. And the it's all posted Amy, on, Amy yeah, sent on the, the link. Website. I just printed it out.
And okay, great. Ross sent the population. I just the census, whatever. I, I just printed it out. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Okay. Great. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, next up on our agenda, uh, two items. One was a, a short budget assessment of the FY23 budget that, that I put together, just sort of an assessment of how we did. I, I think I'm going to defer that just in the interest of time. Next time we meet, I, I can walk you through that. It's like three or four slides. Um, but I did want to real quick uh, show you a, a draft memo. So I, I met with Don and Jenny and Nanashka last week, and they had expressed some concerns that our process for uh, the, the, our departments and boards process for requesting transfers has maybe um, gotten a little a little looser than it used to be, and some of the justifications were, were a little uh, a little lacking. And um, often, folks requesting a transfer. Uh, are not don't attend the meeting, so we can't ask them questions. Um, so anyway, I put together a, a draft memo, and I just wanted to. So so this is the the draft memo. It's it's very short. Um, just to emphasize to boards and departments, uh, you know, really two things, and 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 one is that transfers out of our reserve fund should really be to incur uh, to reimburse actual incurred expenses, not anticipated expenses. There have been a few cases over the last couple of years where we've transferred funds for anticipated expenses and, and ended up not spending those and they have to get them transferred back. Um, so this was just to emphasize to people, you know, really let's use it for incurred expenses only. And And the second part of this memo was Please provide a clear justification, attach supporting documents such as invoices. And I threw out a, a number here of $1,000. If your request is greater than $1,000, please attend the meeting so we can discuss it. Uh, if it's less than $1,000, I, I figured we can just read your justification. Um, so anyway... I don't know that we need to vote on this. I, I just wanted to, to present it. And if anyone has thoughts or suggestions, um, you know, please let me know. I like what you did, Bob. Um, and we're, as I understand it, we're sort of the screening for the uh, select board because in the, when you talk about un, 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 expenses that have not been incurred yet, uh, or anticipated expenses. My first thought is no, <laughs> and that only the select board should agree with that. But since we're in an advisory role, I think this is fine. Right. And in some cases where I've, I've said anticipated expenses, it was something similar to, to like um, the beaver issue we heard about tonight where... Sure. You know, we, we know it's coming. We know it wasn't built into the budget. Um, okay. Okay, so um, I will, I'll send that around before we, we send it to the board. I, I sent it to Don to send it to the boards and departments. Um, but if- uh, Bob, anyway. Bob, quick, quick question. Um, I, I know a lot of our transfer requests are legal fees. Should we, for the thousand dollars, should we have a carve out for something that we know is going to occur? Um, to, to because I, I I don't think we need somebody to attend to explain the legal fees because we always get those. Um. Yeah. No. No. You're, you're right. It's a good point. Um. We might want to just let them attend, you know, anyway, at least initially, just to sort of get back in the get back in the swing of of you know advocating for your request. Yeah. Okay. Just a thought. As, as someone who used to close the books for large companies, we used to have to contact for some material like legal fee, we'd contact the legal firm. Each department would have to say who they're working with. 
and we'd contact the legal firm and get an idea of what is going to be owed. Now, that's accrual basis accounting. I know we're cash basis or whatever the Gatsby stuff is. Um, but to my mind, that's a good practice, especially on something that would be expected like legal fees. I think one thing we we should do when we're planning the FY25 budget is take a hard look at the legal budget because it seems like it's been underfunded the last okay. couple of years. Good point. Um, okay. Any other uh, committee business that we need to discuss? Um, so I, I think uh, we'll probably meet roughly monthly over the next few months just to approve the you know, transfer requests as they come in. Um, probably in November, we'll have a better sense of the the calendar for a calendar year 24 when we, when we start, you know, things get very busy starting in January. So we can walk through that calendar probably around the November timeframe. Uh, and in December, we typically do the, the budget preview. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll communicate by email, but plan on probably a monthly or so meeting for the fall. All right. Uh, if there's nothing else, is there a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. adjourn. <laughs> Second, then. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for sticking around for the whole thing. <laughs>